Welcome to the fourth lecture of uh, Introduction to GIS. Uh, today we're going to talk about databases. Um, really today is going to focus on uh, what goes into a database, what they consist of, how we should think about them, and um, uh, really what I hope for today for most of you is to really get an understanding of what you're actually looking at when we open up um, ArcMap or ArcPro or QGIS, or really any of these um, GIS systems that we have on a computer base. So before I get like into everything here, yesterday we talked about uh, data structure and um, really what goes into uh, the creation of GIS data. So today we're really going to uh, focus on what we're using to house that type of information. And obviously what we have here is a database. And so in, in many cases, a database, at least for me, has always been this mythical, um, powerful storehouse or warehouse basically that I can't see that exists in my computer uh, and that I don't really understand how it works but I know that it exists and I know from all of Hollywood and everything that you have these massive uh, ways of hacking into them and pulling all of this great information. In reality a database is, is not as cool as that sounds. I mean I'm sure there's certain certainly databases that exist that are all that cool that Hollywood lo would love for us to see. But in reality, a basic database is really not much more than an Excel spreadsheet, right? It controls, it holds information, right? So it's a shared collection of data with a secured controlled access. And what that means is that it, you basically have a large area in which data is structured and stored in a way so that it is accessible and managed and there is only a few portals in which you can enter and retrieve that information and, and use it. So data is stored independently of their application. And in a, GIS, in a GIS sense, it contains the geographic data. So what I mean by that is that when you open up ArcMap or QGIS or ArcPro or really any GIS software, you have the graphical user interface that you are seeing. And what that does is it accesses a separate set of files that is the database in which is houses every piece of information that we're going to be looking at. And that separate file is what we call a database management system or a DBMS. Uh, and it's really a collection of software programs that facilitates uh, correct, proper, and effective storage of data. And so when we're doing GIS or we're using a GIS, there is a specific type of database that is specifically designed to handle GIS information. So when we're looking at uh, databases, there's really some levels of abstraction that we need to think about. So there's what we are physically thinking about and how we physically store that data. That is really the top form. Uh, really the introduction is the conceptual. And so the conceptual data model is really how we perceive the real world. And then after we've perceived whatever this data is, we then logically fit it into um, a, a way of forming uh, the structure for a computer to understand. So it's a formal description of the data model. And then finally, the final like level of the computer oriented style is the physical data model, which is the actual storage of the data, its format, order, and path. And so this may be not be something that you normally look at, but if you were on a PC and you go into your file and explore and you go into a bunch of different files until you find a single piece of of data, so a single file. If you look up top, you're going to see the, the pathway that you took to find that specific file within the computer memory. That is what we mean by the type of physical storage. It is ways of holding not only the format, so the file type, uh, it also controls how you access and how you would um, basically pull that information into a separate function. So this um, this graph really shows what we're looking at here. So you ha you start at the top as a human being, we're looking at reality, right? And then we conceptualize what we're looking at into something that's a little bit more abstract. And then we move into this logical idea of what, uh, what comes before what, so then it can then finally be loaded into a physical model of a computer oriented database management system, right? Uh, really, when we're thinking about databases, there are records, fields, and keys. A row, so it, it, the best way to think about this is really to think about it as an Excel spreadsheet. I, I really, uh, and while an Excel itself is obviously a graphical user interface that 
contains a powerful matrix behind it that you can enter information into. It also helps as a really great example of this. And so when you're entering uh, information into an Excel spreadsheet, I, I would question any person that decides that a column is an entry rather than a row. A column is what you call a field. It means that you label it as an attribute, where a row is a record or it's a single entity of a type of, of, of feature, really. So if we're thinking about an Excel spreadsheet to measure archaeological sites, the attributes of what you're trying to list for each archaeological site are going to be listed as unique columns. And that top row is the header where you actually are defining in plain English what uh, information is being stored in that column and the row is each entity so each row is a single archaeological site so there are specific things that we need to think about when we are creating or managing a database uh, there are specific functions that need to happen and the the primary three are the ability to add change or delete records um, it basically allowing your your database to grow and to shrink depending on what your information you're adding. In many cases, uh, this is already done for us as we are using with we are working within a database management system rather than are designing our own. And so you have a powerful back entryway and where everything is already taken care of and you can already have functions and ways of doing this. But if you were to create your own database management system, those are three major keys that need to be considered when you're making a database. And then finally, once you have those ideas of adding, updating, and deleting, extracting information from data and maintaining uh, security and integrity is also important. So what that means is that you need to have the ability to query a database. Uh, in many cases, there's actually computer languages that are designed specifically for the purpose of querying database. Uh, the most popular is SQL or SQL. Uh, it is literally designed, and if you were to, uh, in, a, in a way, code in SQL, um, Personally, from my own personal experience, usually SQL coding is only a couple of lines to specifically get a function uh, of a database. And so there isn't really like a full script, so to speak, but I, I could be wrong. Maybe my experience is a little bit different for those that have uh, a powerful experience with using the language. However, uh, th this type of language like SQL that allows you to query a database and basically say, I am looking for file X that... Um, that fulfills requirements X, uh, Z, Y, and B. Or uh, to put that in a real sense, I am looking for archeological sites that exist in the Umbrian region, have been excavated in the last uh, 30 years, and um, are Roman or Etruscan origin. And so if a database existed in that sense of including all of the archeological sites in Italy, let's say, you what a query does is it's going to pull everything up that fulfills those requirements. You can also flip that side and where you can basically say everything but something. Uh, and what that allows you to do is it extracts information. Uh, to get into the data security, I mean, that's pretty straightforward. We live in a world where data is everything. It's been called the new oil and all of our information somehow exists in a digital format. The responsibility of a database management system is to make sure that that data is properly secured uh, and it can't be uh, malignantly uh, affected. And then obviously, once everything has been attached within a database management system, you need to provide support for applications to use that database and uh, make it, make use of it. So a great example of this would be, um, uh, let me think of a good one. Really, uh, if you had a database, you want it GIS to be able to access it. So if I wanted to create a... Um, an access database, so a Microsoft Office Suite database that comes with a graphical user interface, has easy access, and is very uh, com uh, user friendly. I want that application that creates a database to create a database that is usable outside of the proprietary software that is sold by Microsoft. So I would want that access database to be you be able to be used by ArcGIS or another application that I am trying to work with. 
So when we're looking at database models, there are essentially four different types of models. You have the hierarchical model, which is really organizing your data into a hierarchy. And you are able to pull at different pieces of the hierarchy and get uh, under an understanding of what is happening on either side. A network model, instead of having a hierarchy uh, across the pyramid or across a, low, uh, a tree, you end up having a network, which is all on one level, but it takes keys and relates data to uh, different pieces of of other tables through a network of organization. These two types of databases are not used in GIS. They are uh, a little bit older understanding of how data should be organized within a management system and relational data models and object oriented data sets are far more likely to be used particularly within a GIS because the ease of access of both space with a relational data model, which I'll get into later, and then object oriented, which basically explains how all of the attributes, all of the processes, uh, and really everything that goes with each entity within that database exists as a unique object, and all of it is self contained, which, while maybe not so much, it not as easily. Um, managed or uh, it's not as safe space safe space space saving I guess is the word space saving memory saving it's a little bit larger of a data set uh, but with the size of today's computers that's not always as much of an issue which means that object oriented and this whole self containment of having entities um, that exist and contain all of their attributes as a single row that really ends up becoming a much more useful type of data model within an ArcGIS or it's just a GIS program in general. So in a relationship model, a uh, relational database model, the database consists of several tables. Each record, like I said before, is a row and a column is a field. So you can see from this graph that your object ID is explicitly saying that uh, entity one, two, and three have uh, these values. In this case, it's land use. And if you were to join these two tables, you can see that the entity is joined by a, uh, a key. Uh, in this case, the key is going to be land use code. And the reason that it's called a key is because both um, files, both tables have uh, land use. And so if you can join both of them together, you're able to see that the value is there, right? So land use code in the join table is going to have a value of two together. Uh, and there you're going to able to see what that land use type is and create a larger file. Uh, every field can be used as a key in a search, but to make a cross file search that's using a join, at least one field needs to be in common uh, with both files. And a link table is then created with the needed attributes without taking up actual storage space. And so what that means is that when you make a join and you create that table there, that file, that join file, I should say, you're not actually taking up more computer memory. You're, you're actually using the original files and just showing the relationship between them. Uh, a great example is the one that, uh, the, the example, or yeah, I guess it would be the example of the graph that was from uh, our last lecture and where we were looking at uh, the digital map of uh, node node network, I believe is what we were looking for. Um, but basically what you see here is a very simplified example of a graphical user interface of a GIS and everything that's contained within it. So you have the digital map or what you would see on the screen making a connection between nodes, lines, and polygons. Below you have three separate tables that include the relationships of polygons, nodes, and links. The link is available, the, the links of all polygons, nodes, and topologies are available uh, as a key to all of these files. And so you would use the links as a key to rel uh, relate all of these different tables together, creating one mass join table to control all of the information of this digital map. So with any example, there is always going to be uh, advantages and disadvantages to a different type of model. And that's why there's always many different types of models. Uh, in this case, for a relational data model, uh, it's very flexible uh, and there's no structure restrictions for a search. So basically, as long as there's a key, uh, you can more or less make a search and make an easy join. And it's very easy to understand by basically acknowledging as long as you have one column that fits together, 
uh, it, you can see it and it's usually done in plain English and so the keys are uh, easily understood. Uh, the other benefit here is also the fact that when you make a join between multiple tables, you're not rewriting or creating a new entity within that relational database. It's simply joining these existing files together related to a single key. And then once you've closed or powered off that database management, that link goes away and so the files still exist as separate things and it require uh, it means that there's less data redundancy and therefore less um, need for more space the problem with this and it can be a problem is that there may be uh, one to many relationships or uh, many to many relationships between tables and so what that basically means is that it, when you start dealing with very complex data uh, while there may be it may be a very simple one-to-one -one key that may not be always be the case. Uh, a great example of this would be a relation, using a relational data model for soils data. There are many different tables and different um, pieces of information that are contained within a soils-based data set. And there are many ways to create a key. It, it does, in some cases, create redundancies within that data set. When you, when you make a join, you're going to see multiple fields and multi, or, yeah, multiple fields that are essentially saying the same thing. So the next type of data model is your object-oriented database. Uh, it uses a form of encapsulation or containment to basically say that attributes of data and the processes that are explained or are done with data are all contained inside of an object. And these objects uh, both inherit traits from the set of objects above them and pass down traits to those subfields below them. Uh, the best way to really think about uh, object-oriented data sets and how they are structured is really to think about evolution um, within like the animal kingdom. We as human beings have um, wisdom teeth not because they perform a function for us now but because in previous essentially models of hominids they had a purpose. Another way of saying encapsulation is that the attributes of the data and the functions or processes that are being performed on said data are combined together in that single object. So this is my one of my favorite little graphs here. Uh, it's a really good explanation of, of how inheritance works. Uh, I have the arrows a little bit backwards here, but it, it works the same. So inheritance, data and functions are organized in a hierarchy and objects inherit characteristics and functions of their ancestor. So. It, the best way to actually think about this without looking at the arrows here is that animals have a head and a body, right? And so the, the class above contains three traits that need to then be passed down to their um, sub-levels. So animals then splits off into mammals and fish. And mammals has a head, a body, and requires feeding, but it requires four legs and can sit. Whereas fish have a head, body, and can need refeeding, but they have fins and can swim. That's the the separation uh, from the original animal class and piles on more attributes as you go down further along the pyramid or along the tree. So when we think about association and aggregation within an or object-oriented data model, uh, it's basically a way of explaining a member of versus a part of. So a habitat is a part of an aquatic system, whereas a fish is a member of. Uh, and basically what that explains is how that all combines to the overarching aquatic system. I know it's kind of a gray area here, but once you start working with data sets and data pieces of uh, attributes, as well as uh, actual entities within an object-oriented data model, it starts to make more sense. So again, with anything, there's always the advantages and disadvantages. So for the advantages of an object-oriented data model, uh, it's very easy to model, and that's because it's uh, very close to how humans perceive their actual environment. We always are thinking of things as um, large hierarchical trees, even though we may not think of them as trees in our own head when we break down our way of thinking and how we perceive of objects or people and um, really just our environment in general, it, it, it's really organized in this hierarchical sense. I mean, we've even, uh, what is it, the Linnaean taxonomic system? Uh, I believe that's the one. Uh, and where we've really structured our entire 
every living thing into a, a, a system that is more or less split from kingdoms. Um, this allows for us to reduce the complexity of software development because it's very easy to understand. It's also very easy for an individual to read. Uh, the disadvantages here is that most existing object-based systems are really a hybrid of both the relational with keys and object-based databases. So basically encoding a key inside of an object to combine both uh, types of databases. So uh, object relational databases use an enriched set of graphic element types on the top three basic types of points, lines, and polygons. So uh, basically you define the point and then they express, they further spread around that hierarchical set of elements where uh, lines stretch from points with a distance where and polygons stretch from points and ha are have required to be uh, enclosed. So there are two levels of geometries, feature geometry and components of feature geometry. Uh, features in a geo database have one of four types of geometry, points, multipoint, polyline, and polygon. Uh, I really think that these are kind of straightforward once you start thinking about what it takes to create these different types of um, features. Uh, polylines are comprised of one of or many paths. Polygons have to be closed. A path is really just a simple connected series of the four types of segments and a path itself cannot be uh, intersected. Uh, within the four types of segments that are presently supported in a geo database, we can start to introduce these new different types of segments like uh, lines, circular arcs, or what we would call splines, which are really these circular arcs, elliptical arcs, and bezier curves. Uh, they all essentially do the same thing. It's just that you've essentially changed the requirements of a line inside of the database to fulfill whatever the segment is that you're designing. So uh, feature classes with line geometry have several predefined fields, such as uh, a, obviously the FID. The feature ID is going to be required for just about every type of feature that you have inside of a GIS. Uh, the geometry tracking field to record the length and the geometry, so uh, what type of geometry you're looking at, which is also going to be the shape. Uh, and then the other fields are custom fields. So some examples are coded values for road type, or uh, in this case, I don't really think of lines, but it would still work for road type for archaeological data. So, or a descriptive string of the surface type, you know, road width, numeric value of the number of lanes, or the type of text. So, what you see here in this graph really shows how you would both have plain English or a way of understanding in plain English what the database is doing, while also in recording a large number of values uh, or in attributes within uh, this database that can later have analytical sources done on it, depending on what you're doing. And all attributes have to be based on specific types of information. So a float is a single type of number where a double short integer uh, basically explain the type of inf information that you're passing within number. A long integer is going to be a multi, a long integer is going to be more than a specific number of uh, value or the length of, of a number. And then text and date are obviously orientated into something slightly different. Uh, you can see here that there's a type and then that is going to be your code in which you're basically able to, uh, or not your code, your key and where you're going to actually link uh, multiple tables together to provide more information while also reducing the scope of the actual table. Uh, so again, if we're thinking about uh, the levels of abstraction, right, we're going to start with the real world and then we're going to move to conceptual. The conceptual is the objects and the relationships. And then once we have those relationships and the objects that are actually going to be explained within a database, you move into the logical model. The logical model consists of diagrams and lists of e explanation of what is within those objects. And then after you've got that logical list and model explained, you're finally able to uh, move into a physical model, which is essentially the database scheme. So there are many different types of spatial databases. These are three uh, major ones. You have uh, database two spatial extender, which I believe is uh, done by, it's not Oracle, it's going to be IBM. And then uh, Oracle obviously is a huge database management company. Um, they exist on their own. They have more than just GIS, but it's a very, um, very heavily focused and very uh, well-grounded database management system. And then in a sense, we also have ArcGIS, which itself is 
more of a user interface, but it, in itself with the program, it has a database management system in which it is able to either connect to Oracle or database two, or um, I believe it connects to the Microsoft one, which I had named earlier, but now I can't think of the name of it's, um, oh shoot, what is the name of that? Access, that's right. Uh, access databases, you're able to connect, and ArcGIS is much more of a, a connection or extension software that is able to contain small amounts of information, but once you start trying to pull all of that information up along a graphical user interface, that is what you're seeing on the screen, it becomes a lot more difficult to uh, really examine. Uh, so I believe that's it for today. Uh, I'm going to end it there. We're going to move on to... Um, Oh, we're going to move on to data, which is the first thing that we're going to actually start talking about is different types of GIS data within a um, within what we can use within it. And so the first part of this is going to be a little less important to archaeologists, but it, it's data that we need to consider because when you're doing GIS, um, the one thing I, I really want to keep hammering down is that you don't just make maps. And so you need to consider many different types of data within a GIS. And while you may not think that archeologists or um, biologists need census, census data, there is a level of importance of knowing that this exists and that you could ask a question. In this case, uh, for archeologists, so to speak, in this class, we could be thinking about census data as a way of really understanding populations around important archaeological sites. Uh, it, it may help with understanding looting or erosion.